Hi guys, my name is Pam. Welcome back to my channel. If you've been here before, thank you if you have. Um, if you're new here, I hope you enjoy it. I'm by no means a professional videographer of any kind, straight form. Just, you know, I have a jazzy new phone that I can do better bit videos with. So I thought, well, let's, let's give it a go and see what happens. Um, so... This is actually, I had posted a video on the 20th of December. Um, today is the 21st of December. I am not going to post it today. I'm going to hold off until after Christmas, probably Monday or Tuesday, um, just for a little, give you all a little break from, I think my last video was like an hour and 15 minutes or something like that. So, you know, if you made it all the way through that video, good on you. Um, I will try to endeavor if, if it looks like this video is going to go much over, you know, half an hour or so. It probably will. I'll probably break it up into smaller chunks and divvy it out through, you know, for a period of time kind of deal. As always, if you hear some kind of snorting, snoring, gross sounds over my voice, it's the famous Pearl, the one with the upper respiratory that I, you know, she's happy with it, but she's constantly producing snot. So that's my life right now. Um, so the video from yesterday, which I called Seed Catalog Palooza. Um, and I just want to mention before I get, if I get comments, you know, that is by no means, I know people, there are people who have way more catalogs than I ever would think to uh, having. Um, but I am expecting a lot, well, hopefully expecting more. I just, I want to get my catalog so I can see what I'm buying. Um, I've already made two purchases. Um, one site, the MI Gardener from the YouTube channel of the same name with Luke. Um, I purchased, I made a purchase Sunday and the other one was uh, Select Seeds. That was because they had advertised an end of the year sale that I actually could. Um, I don't know about you, but I know this, you know, the inflation price increases and things like that. There's really not a whole lot of choice um, these days, but when I hear end of the year sales and then I go to the website and it's like 15% off, I guess I've kind of gotten spoiled that usually end of the year sale means you know, 50% off, buy one, get one free, you know, that kind of thing. So, wah, wah, I know. Um, so in these days and age, so basically what I'm doing, when I get seed catalogs, I must have a seed buying addiction or something because I will buy seeds just because it looks cool, that kind of thing. Um, but as you can see with my handy dandy little file box here, this is a file box. It's very dirty for some reason. Um, I've had it for 20, 25 years, not as a seed box actually to hold files and things like that. And then I got so many files. I think I have two of these plastic boxes. Um, I, I ended up getting so many files going that I went ahead and bought a regular like four drawer metal file cabinet. So I have basically two of these plastic file boxes. The other one, I think it has old stuff, old files and things like that that I need to go through and see if they can be purged, thrown on the burn pile or something. But um, yeah, so this one, this is my, my seed holding capacity. It's, say how large it is. Oh, just a jumbo file. Ooh, and I bought it in Knoxville, Tennessee. <laughs> so before you get too excited, it's not stuffed full. Well, yeah, maybe it is. <laughs> and one of these days, I really do hope to... Uh, I've seen a lot of people going through their, their little caches of, of seeds and things like that. that They have the nice little crafters, little plastic boxes that, that you know seal together and then you put it in the bigger box for the little handle to, to move things around. Um, 
one of these days I will, ooh, look, my glasses are crooked. Let's fit it up here. I don't need to see what I look like. Um, so yeah, one of these days I do aspire to getting something that's a little bit more contemporary for right now. I'm relying on Ziploc bags, but I'll show you kind of my, what my process is. So buying seeds. So I keep track of my seeds a couple of different ways. I keep them in the box, keeping them in the box and sealed, keeping them out, you know, they're inside the house, you know, year round, they're out of the sun so they don't get too hot or too cold or anything like that. Um, I've heard of people putting seeds in the refrigerator and in the freezer and things like that. So far, I've really not had that problem. Um, and maybe at some point, if I do actually purchase a, you know, ref uh, like a used refrigerator or something like that, that I can put downstairs in the basement, I might go as far as putting it down there. But so far, I really haven't really had the need the, to do that. So we're going to hold off on that expense. Um, but what I do is I keep track of all the seeds, try and keep everything in this box. Um, so what my schedule is during the year. So I have actually a couple of spreadsheets on my computer that I use for keeping track of my seeds and then keeping track of when I planted them, that kind of, that kind of thing. Beaker, I let you out five seconds ago. You can stay out there a little longer. It's warmer out there. He's not buying it. Where was I? Oh yeah, so uh, spreadsheets. So I have two different kinds of spreadsheets going on. I have one, I have a Mac computer. So my system is the numbers uh, program or app um, on a you know, a Microsoft kind of computer, you would use, you know, the, the Windows Microsoft um, Excel program. God, it's been so long since I've had, I've used Windows, it's weird. Um, so it's pretty easy, just basic spreadsheets. As I find information that I want to include, I'll add a different, you know, a new column. If there's something that I find, you know, I really don't need, I'll, you know, just remove it. So it's kind of easy to do it on the computer because it's easier to manipulate than, you know, having the graph paper and the, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I don't have the best handwriting. So there's like periods when I was doing it before the computer going, what did I write here? So, um, so yeah, so the spreadsheet for the seeds that I have, the ones that I have on hand, what I'll basically do is I did this um, back in November. I try and keep track all the way through the year. The year, so like in June, if I run out of a certain variety of tomato kind of seeds, I try and go in there and, and put down on the chart on the the spreadsheet that I'm out. I have that category on the on the spreadsheet that I'll need to buy seeds the following year. Um, I also have notations if I liked the variety and if I should buy it again if I run out. I have, you know, stuff like that. Try and keep up with that as best I can. Um, not always the best at being that organized, but I'm trying and it's something. Um, one thing I know for sure that if I don't write it down somewhere and I think, oh, I'll remember that easy. I don't remember what I had for breakfast this morning. Exaggeration, but you kind of get what I mean. You know, menopause didn't help. Um, just the fact that, you know, I'm blonde. Yeah, stuff like that. Um, so the memory is not what it used to be. So if I try to say, oh yeah, I'll remember that next time I go to buy seeds, I won't remember to do that. So the important stuff, you know, I try and keep up at least with that spreadsheet. The other spreadsheet that I have of when I plant seeds in the spring and when I go and transplant them out in the garden or what kind of yields I get, that's the stuff that I don't keep on top of like I want to. So I'm hoping to do better with that. Um, 
because I'm actually I'm trying to be a little bit more judicious with my timing so that I can get multiple crops going in each bed throughout the year um, because you know if there's one thing I've learned you know you know watching like Charles Dowding and Hugh Richards and um, a lot of the others especially over in Great Britain those youtubers and stuff like that they seem to have a handle on you know getting stuff turned over for a new crop and all that kind of stuff um, and I don't know if that's just a British thing because they usually have the, the allotments with a certain amount of space for their gardening um, crops and stuff like that and if they just have to be that thrifty or if you know British people are just that thrifty all told you know I'm five-eighths British I'm not I, I yeah I can't do that without a lot of help and so what I'm hoping to do is be a little bit more up on that kind of information that I'm writing down so I know okay so this variety of tomatoes uh, it's a determinant so it should pretty much be out you know you know no more tomatoes being grown after August 1st or, or whatever it tends to be so I either need to have another tomato of maybe the same kind or a different kind to once I whack down the, the tomato plant that's spent now, you know, whack it down. Do I put another tomato plant there? Do I put something completely different? That kind of thing. So I'm trying to be a little bit more conscious of that kind of stuff because uh, time is getting a little bit more precious. Um, you know, sit around, you know, messing around, trying to remember what you were going, planning on doing on that bed is just not cool. There are a variety, I've seen a variety of different like apps and programs and websites that you can go and, and read stuff on, but do your research for your area, know your first frost date, your last frost date, so you know when the packet of seeds says, you know, start these seeds inside four to six weeks before your first, your last frost date in the spring. You know, mine is middle of April, thereabouts so I know if that's the case I try and get that those seeds planted you know in the the seed modules by March 1st um, and again it's a timing thing sometimes it's not convenient sometimes I forget and then I go and look at my spreadsheet and it's like oh I'm a month late too bad you know I go ahead and do it anyway but still you know it, that's time that I could have spent better places so let me get set up here with the different seeds. I'm going to do these sections. I'm going to do the veggies. I've got herbs, flowers, and then cover crops. And I'll just see how timing is going. I mean, this little segment's already going on like 15 minutes. So I'm trying not to be too long-winded is the word I think we're looking for. So, uh, yeah, so I'll get set up here and then we'll get started. Probably do whatever I pull out of the, the container first. So, hang on. Okay, so herbs jumped out in front of me. And so that's what we're going to get started on. So we'll see if we can, we can see. Now, um, this is what I have left over. Some of these self-seed very readily. And I may not ever have to, like, uh, this is Anna's Hyssop. Got it territorial. And this is from 2019. And there's several seeds in here. Anna's Hyssop is one of those things that will come back. Um, when I first started growing it, um, and it says it's like three to four feet tall. The first couple of years that I grew it, it did not get that tall. It got maybe foot, foot and a half, so 18, 12, inch, 12 18 inches. And I was like, eh. But the bees really liked it. It had pretty little blue, um, very is similar to like, you know, rosemary blossoms and almost like uh, lavender. It doesn't have the same scent or anything like that. It smells kind of like licorice. I don't, as a common rule like licorice stuff but it smells really good and supposedly you can make a really good nice tea out of it um 
So it's hardy to zone five in here. So if you're looking for a bee plant and you've not tried Anna's Hyssop, I got this. This is the regular with blue flowers and green foliage. There's also another one. Oh, what was that called? It actually had the, the green leaves and things like that. Actually looked like more like a, a lemon, almost like a lime green kind of color. And it was not as winter hardy as regular Anna's Hyssop. I haven't had any of that come back last I didn't come back last year I do however as of last year the ones that had been 18 inches max for the last few years last year one of them did get up to four feet so I guess it's a maturation kind of deal so Anna's hyssop good for tea good for the bees and it makes it it's just you really can't you're kind of goof proof kind of deal all right, the ubiquitous date basil. So we already talked the last video. I had gotten purchased a couple of different kinds of basil, the Tulsi or the Holy basil, and then I gotten the uh, Emerald Towers that goes you know, up up in a column rather than kind of making the mounding kind of effect. But I have seeds left over from. Really, you can't do that in another room. This is why it takes so long. I swear, I think she's on the verge of death and then she just looks at me with a booger coming out of her nostril. It's like, whatever. So Pearl's taken care of, she's okay. All right, so these are what I have left over. Um, so I've got two different kinds of just regular, like the kind you would use for pesto, the culinary kind. Um, there's Dolce Fresca, this is from Seeds and Such. Um, the packet, this one is from 2019. That, are there even any seeds in here? Yes, there are a few seeds in here. All right, so, so these are going to be going on four years old. Um, if, for some reason, they don't germinate well, I bought another pack this year, so I have backups should the older pack not work. And the other one is a variety called Newton. Um, I'll see if I can add pictures post-production. I was gonna say posthumously, but that's not right. Um, pictures, but it's, it's basically basil. These are the guys that I try so hard to keep the flower buds picked off of, but they always get, ahead, get away from me and then they go in and they start flowering. And pretty much once they start flowering, the taste changes and it's just not as good for me at least. Um, so that's why I'm trying that Emerald Towers just to see if the the claims that they don't go to flower as quickly as, as stuff like this does. So we'll see. So hopefully the Emerald Towers will be for me and these two will be for bees and such. And then I have the lemon basil and the lime basil. Um, Taste-wise, between lime and lemon, you know, I don't, it tastes citrusy, but I think the, the difference is that I can tell the most rather than taste is that the lime basil has smaller leaves than the, than the lemon. Um, so if you like that kind of thing, they also have cinnamon basil and all kinds of different colors or flavors and colors. They also have like purple basils and things like that. I just have not... I've grown the purple basil before and I'm guessing I just, you know, the thought of having purple pesto just, so if I get purple basil again, it would be so it could flower and go to the bees. So my next package here is borage, good old borage. Borage is kind of iffy up here in Tennessee because it's not so much the cold weather that does it in, it's the hot dry weather when we get like a, a really dry, hot spell in the summertime, July and August kind of deal. And we had a pretty good one last year, so it may be that my borage doesn't come back. Um, it is an annual, but it, it's supposed to self-sow itself. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So I just have more ready to go because I do like it. I like those little blue flowers and they kind of, they, they kind of smell and taste kind of like cucumber, so you can actually freeze the flowers in like ice cubes and, and be posh, you know, 
posh. Do the, the teacup. Um, so yeah, so I don't, you, as a general, you know, except if I go and, you know, I'll taste a leaf or something like that, it's not really that cucumbery to me, but it's edible. So every once in a while, I'll give it a try and see if my taste change. So far, I haven't. So it's basically a bee plant just because the blue flowers are pretty. German and Roman chamomile. So what's the difference between the two? So the German chamomile is the annual. And this is the stuff that you would use to harvest the flowers to make chamomile tea. Roman chamomile also will produce flowers, but it's a more low growing, so it's a little bit easier to get in there and get the flowers, but it doesn't have to. So the Roman chamomile, this is a perennial. This is the stuff that you would see if, you know, people use it to, to line walkways in between stones and things like that because it's just very low growing. It'll help suppress weeds and stuff. Um, both chamomiles prefer, they're kind of like lavenders and oreganos and rosemaries and things like that. They like it a little bit more on the dry side, you know, not like parched desert dry or anything like that, but, you know, they don't like wet roots, basically. So moist soil, but they're okay if, once they're established if, it, if, you know, it doesn't rain for several weeks. Then I bought from Baker Creek this last year, I bought a variety of chamomile known as Kelway Golden. So, and then when you go to between different seed catalogs and stuff like that, this is either a chamomile or it's a variety called Golden Marguerite, which is more like a daisy. So it's like maybe daisies and chamomile are related. Don't know, don't care. But I just kind of like those little cheery little yellow flowers. The flowers on the, the chamomile, they have the little yellow center and then white flower petals around the side, the edges. Kind of. So I just kind of like the idea that it was all, all yellow. But uh, chamomile, this is a, when it was the plants that I, I had before that was gold, pictured as, as golden marguerite, it was actually listed as a dyeing plant you could take the flowers and use it to make dye for you know yarn and things like that um i have two three f four plants that are keeping going that keep coming back and i'm good with it so i don't need to get the golden marguerite i just wanted to try this and see if yes is it more like the golden marguerite or is it more like the chamomile so We'll see. Does it say how tall it is? Uh, nope. All right, cilantro. So I grew a bunch of cilantro last year, last spring, and was like, okay, I'm gonna keep a track on this. I'm gonna pick cilantro and make things like salsas and things like that. I'm one of those people that I'm okay with cilantro. There are people out there that there's something about their taste buds that if they try and eat cilantro, it tastes like, I've had it described as tasting like soap. Um, I'm not one of those people, so I'm okay with cilantro. Normally, I would just do parsley in my salsas, but I thought, okay, this year I'll grow cilantro and do it more authentic. Well, the only problem was is that cilantro likes cooler weather, and I didn't pick and like freeze any of the cilantro before it actually went to seed. Now I didn't use slow bolt. I just used a regular cilantro. I think I had gotten the year before or something like that. I was like, well, let's not do that. So I went ahead and bought this from Baker Creek. Um, this is the slow bolt. So it's supposed to start to not go to seed quite so quickly. So I'm hoping either to remember to sow some for fall use as well, so I can keep going into the, the season with cilantro, or that it's not gonna go to flower so quickly, I can actually harvest some and either freeze it or have it in time when I have tomatoes so I can go ahead and make my salsa with all fresh ingredients. Let you know how that goes. Okay, dill. 
Dill is another one of those things that it may or may not self-sew. Um, they're listed as... No, they're not. Let's see what it says on here. Dun, dun, dun. All right, it doesn't say. So dill is one of those things that if I get a mild winter, the plants will come back. If I don't get a mild winter, the seeds that I, you know, neglect to to grab from the plants before they die for the winter will come back. So it's very rare that I have to actually plant dill. I don't use that much of it when I do make pickles and things like that. You know, a little goes a long way. You only need like one of those little spikes of flowers and the seeds to go in a, a jar of pickles. But um, there are the kind of thing pollinators do like the flowers. So if you don't get to it, you can do it. If you're, you like fish, fish, you know, dill and fish go together hand in hand. If you're Scandinavian, you know you like dill. Um, dill and yogurt or sour cream you know, and it's okay. I like it. Um, but mostly what I do is I do it for pickles and I do it just for the pollinators and not just, you know, bees, not so much, but bumblebees and butterflies and things like that. Really like them. All right. So this one doesn't really qualify as an herb, but I put it here anyway. So this is, oh, wait, got in the head. Never mind. Fennel. Fennel is related to dill. Now the one thing that I have been told is that if you plant dill and fennel close to each other they can cross pollinate and then the resulting plants that come up from seeds the following year may not be their their dental or fill something like that. Fell. Um, I have not had that problem yet because mostly because the fennel doesn't come back at all. Um, this is the, the bronze fennel, so the leaves have a nice bronzy color. It's actually pretty, pretty fun, uh, pretty fun to look at. Um, use the fennel, use it a lot in like Italian sauce, you know, uh, sauces and things like that. And in, uh, um, I frequently will make my own Italian sausage using ground pork from, you know, a farmer that raises pork or baguette at the grocery store, I'll mix stuff up into the ground pork and make my own Italian sausage for making like spaghetti and things like that. Um, so I tried this last year. It Did it go to seed? I think some of it did go to seed. Some of it just stayed the fronzy, you know, leaves that are mostly, that are used for cooking too, like dill. But uh, we'll see if it does come up, come up next year. All right, sweet marjoram. So sweet marjoram is usually in my area treated as an annual. It does not like harsh winters. So maybe if I had a mild winter, it would come back. But so far, I must not have had mild enough winters because it never comes back the following spring. So I've had people say that, you know, you should have oregano and you should have marjoram separately because marjoram is better for more refined. So I think the, I think the rule of thumb, and I'm not trying to annoy or, or insult anybody here, but generally what it's considered, marjoram is considered to be the seasoning of choice in like French cuisine, whereas oregano is more for Italian and Greek and that kind of stuff. So just stronger flavors with the oregano as opposed to the marjoram. I guess French people are delicate. I don't know. Don't really know any French people. Uh, so I grow this every once in a while when I'm just feeling French, delicate. Got extra time and space. Um, but I haven't grown it. This is a from 2019. So, you know, maybe or maybe not plant some next year. All right, so I've got two different things of Monarda here. Um, Monarda didyma, which is the wild form of uh, bee balm. 
If you get this, you can grow these from seed. But if you see, you know, in like on online or go to the nursery centers and see stuff like that, and you see the bee balm that's got the bright red flowers, I've been growing this stuff, you know, off and on for several years now. The only flower colors that I get are like a pinky purple lavender color. So not haven't gotten any red colors here yet. I'm okay with that. I kind of like the pink and purple. This stuff does last. I've got it dotted all around in my beds and stuff like that. Comes back year after year. Um, you can use it for tea. Um, I think this is the one that was back pre-revolutionary war you know the whole boston tea party and all that kind of stuff um this is what the um colonials used because it's actually native to america um they use this instead of like you know black tea like you know, british people always drink um and I think another name for it is bergamot, but it's not the same bergamot that's used to make Earl Grey tea. It's, well, bergamot, I think, is kind of like a citrus that they use to flavor the Earl Grey teas. This kind of has the same kind of flavor profile to it, so I think they call it that just because it's similar. And then there's another one that's Monarda citriodora, which is basically lemon mint. Not really a mint, but Monarda and mint and lavenders and all those kinds of things, all kind of related. So I have the lemon here. Um, I don't have any growing around, so I may try growing a few of these this spring just to see. Um, I think maybe the problem is is that where the, the regular Monarda is perennial, these are just annuals. So maybe I just didn't feel like fooling with it anymore or forgot or something. Then I have my ubiquitous uh, flat leaf parsley and curled parsley. I have flat leaf parsley because I use that in my cooking and pasta sauces and things like that. My mother, however, prefers the curly parsley. I don't know why. Um, so basically what I do, since parsley is a biennial, so basically what it is, you grow it that spring it grows through the year carry over till spring the next year and then it starts going to seed so once it goes to seed i don't use it just because it changes kind of like the basil it changes the flavor of the parsley and so what i'll basically do is i just start parsley every spring and i know a lot of people say they have problems getting it to germinate i seem to have the knack so if you if anyone is looking for a parsley grower get in touch with me i may work cheap you never know um but yeah i, I invariably end up with at least a dozen of each variety even though i'm trying not to just because i'd want to oversee just in case my luck with growing parsley gives out so i grow some the, the curly parsley for my mom and then i'll have both varieties over here just in case the stuff I have over there goes wonky or something. This is the one that I was going to go, not really an herb, but I put it in here anyway. So this is Roselle. Roselle, um, I first learned of it as being called tea hibiscus. So it is related to perennial hibiscus, which I have a couple of plants of those with, with nice big red flowers which is not the same stuff that you get at Lowe's and the nursery centers and stuff like that. Those have a tendency, unless you live down in Florida, they will die over the winter unless you bring it in the house. Um, so the type of perennial uh, hibiscus I have, I grew it from seed. It has big red, the regular looking hibiscus flowers, but it's more hardy. And so far after five years, I've got two plants that keep coming back. Their seeds are pretty pricey. The last time I checked, you could get like five seeds in a packet. The last time I tried it, thinking I was probably going to need a replacement for what I have, none of them grew. The first time I did it, I got the two that I have. So I guess I'm just sticking with those two for right now. 
So hibiscus and okra and this stuff, roselle um, or tea hibiscus, they're all kind of related. And these puppies like okra, like it hot. Um, if you put them out too early, they don't grow. But you have to be careful. The first time I tried this, it worked. I had like five different bushes. I got so many of the little flower calyxes. I had, I had hibiscus tea coming out my ears, basically. Got these seeds last year, attempted to grow them, ended up with two plants, both of which stayed about one foot in height and just did not do anything. So this is the stuff that's supposed to grow in more, a little bit more northern south regions, which is kind of what I am. So I'll give it another try this year. And maybe it was because we had a late spring and I didn't get out and it didn't, didn't have enough growing period. Try it in a different bed, that kind of thing. So we'll see. And then I have sage. Sage is one of those things that can winter kill. It's one of, the, it's kind of plant, kind of like, the little lavenders and the oreganos and the rosemaries and things like that does not like wet feet. Um, so of all the herbs that I really want to grow and have keep coming back year after year after year, sage is the one that I have the most problem with. So it's supposed to be hardy for zones six through nine. I'm seven A, so I should be safe. But just for whatever reason, they do really well the first year. They overwinter, they'll come back, they'll do okay, and then they just don't really do a whole lot. Um, I've had, you know, they, they'll flower for me the whole bit. I'm gonna try, well, I hate to do that because be, the bees really like the flowers on sage. So I may try and experiment and keep one, the flower buds nipped off, and the other just let go and see if there's any difference in it. Um, so sage, everybody knows what sage is for your cooking and stuff like that. Then I have three different kinds of thyme. I have just the regular, um, they call it German or winter thyme, which is kind of more of a, uh, it's more hearty, but it also has a stronger taste than common thyme. Um, so, and it gives off flowers in the spring. Bees really like it. And then I've got just regular creeping thyme. This one has like a couple white flowers and it only gets, you know, a couple inches, two or three inches high. I use it in the beds to kind of use as a, a weed control. And then I've got the magic carpet creeping thyme that has more reddish purpley colors, flowers. And I have not grown any of these from seed in some time because I have a lot of it. So I'm probably going to have to get in there and kind of just like divide different plants and move things around because it's getting a little, little obvious. All right, so let's wrap up this part of the video. So we'll make this part one. I will get this out sometime in between Christmas and New Year's. Um, we'll come back with part two with the flowers and the, and the veggies, um, probably after New Year's. So happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Um, hope you liked the video. If you did, you know, press the like button, subscribe, tell your friends, tell them about the crazy person who rambles on about weird things. And, uh, so yeah, so everyone have a great one and I will see you whenever. Bye.